anxiety about the future is firing on all cylinders. Rules are changing as the new administration commits to take the country in a new direction. We are haunted by visions of imminent heaven or hell upon earth, to quote C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters. Granted, a rapid fire news cycle conjures up one doomsday scenario after another, making it hard to focus on the present. Yet the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Another quote from Lewis. Anyone in real estate, particularly multifamily housing, knows that now holds far greater import than the future. Now is where the power of the future lies. One person who does now exceedingly well is a third generation developer and builder out of beautiful Virginia Beach, Virginia. Steve Lawson, chairman of the Lawson Companies, has developed and ac or acquired just over 6,000 units with another 1,600 in development and construction. Steve's single family division has closed over 340 homes, topping 100 million in sales. The Lawson Companies span management, development, and construction, primarily in the Commonwealth of Virginia. There is that one property in South Carolina, but we'll get to the bottom of that outlier shortly. Steve has done many notable things in and around multifamily business. The one that stands out in my mind is NAHB's monumental regulation study a couple years ago that found regulatory costs account for over 32% of every apartment. That study broke ground around the real causes of our nation's affordable housing shortage. Steve Lawson took the case to Capitol Hill, connecting the dots to the looming question of just why the supply of affordable housing is now at a 10 year low. Steve, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Linda. I, I uh, am flattered by the invitation and thank you for your coverage of uh, this issue and the NEHB uh, work that we do, including the Pillars of the Industry Award, which we were fortunate to be recognized with last year, one of many being recognized. Um, and I did wanna say at, at the outset that I can only accept the, the notion of being a power hitter if I accept that for our entire team. Our team deserves the accolades, not, not me. So we, we've been very fortunate to have found uh, a lot of success and, and are continuing to find that. But thank you for the invitation. And the epitome of grace. <laughs> we need to get to that break in pattern out of the way. 36 properties in Virginia, one in South Carolina. What's the story? Yeah, um, well, it, our primary focus has always been in Virginia. But uh, this was almost 15 years ago. Uh, a couple of opportunities came our way in the Charleston market. And I've always been personally attached to the Charleston market because uh, my father's side of the family actually settled in Charleston when they immigrated from Scotland. Um, so it's a great city. It's a great market. It's performed extremely well. And frankly, we, we wish we had done more work in in that market. Uh, our intent was to grow our footprint in South Carolina, but there were just too many other opportunities closer to home. And, uh, and that's how it happened. It's a good problem to have, no complaints at all. But, uh, but that's, that's how it happened. Your property portfolio is split between market and affordable. How has the performance of the two product types differed since the lockdowns? Um, markedly, as, as you might imagine, our more upscale market rate communities have experienced uh, fewer delinquencies. Working families, especially those that, that depend on hourly wages, are, are clearly strugg struggling the most in the pandemic, and that, that's being reflected in our numbers very clearly. We, we are fortunate that Virginia has created a rental assistance program and that our state agency, Virginia Housing, has done a great job streamlining the delivery of that uh, resource through landlords as, as well, it, or in addition to the direct delivery to residents. So we're able to apply 
on behalf of our residents directly to our state housing finance agency. And that's done a great job to get that resource helping our clients uh, more quickly. That's, it, it's a, that's definitely a, a win-win. Steve, you testified in Congress in 2018 that complying with regulations accounts for nearly one third of the cost of constructing a, a new apartment building. Since then, has the situation improved? Um, not, not significantly, and that's unfortunate. A lot of these costs are imposed at, at the local level, um, but changes in building codes are, are national, but not under the direct purview of the federal government either. That's one of the largest, you know, those two pieces are probably the largest. Um, what we always, however, need to be aware of what I call regulatory creep. Um, most new regulations are put in place with good intent. I don't think anybody goes into this with, with ill intent. But then we add one more regulation and another on top of that. And then we tweak the basket a few more times. And, and in the process, we often lose sight of the impact on the cost of housing. What we have to go back to is we realize that every regulation has a cost. And we simply have to weigh the cost against the benefit, knowing that every extra dollar that we add to the cost of a home or an apartment excludes some families from buying or renting. That's what we need to keep the focus on and, and balance the regulatory impact. So we have new regulations coming out this, building regulations coming out this year that will include energy efficiency. Is that another pylon? I'm a, I, I'm a huge fan of energy efficiency. And I, I think the less we, uh, the more efficient our buildings are, the better for everyone. But you can't change that overnight. And we have some properties in our portfolio that my father built 45 years ago. Those properties are not nearly as efficient as the ones we build today. So I think we have to consider that, consider the, the cost to upgrade the older properties that are in the entire housing stock. And addition to the, in addition to that, Whenever we pass a new energy efficient regulation, we simply need to look at the payback period. Our NEHB economists have done a fantastic job at this. If the cost of that uh, energy improvement is paid back over 30 years, it's probably not realistic. It's probably not going to get that benefit because a lot of building systems don't last 30 years. If that payback is 10 years or less, now we're getting into the realm where it might make sense, but we also have to look at the impact of that on the financing of a home or an apartment community. Because if the benefit of that accrues to the residents, but isn't reflected in rent, then it's not something that we as the builders of that apartment community can monetize in order to pay for the initial cost of upgrading. I hope that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. You have been very prescient, Steve, in the unintended consequences. <laughs> <laughs> there um, are always unintended consequences of, of any legislation. Absolutely. A true engineer's brain. <laughs> yes. You support the Housing Infrastructure Act introduced by Representative Maxine Waters. Tell us why you support it and what are its prospects for passage now that the Democrats control everything? <laughs> yeah, well, th this is another bill that, that I have followed as and NEHB has as well. I, I had the opportunity to testify uh, before the committee on, on uh, with respect to this bill as well. And the cl clearly the prospects for the bill are much improved now with the change in administration. And, and housing is a necessity. It, it's very much part of our national infrastructure. And it, 
a significant cost of development does often go to fund utility infrastructure. And in a lot of cases, roads and schools through, through proper systems that many states have. This bill includes a laundry list of funding priorities. Uh, a huge part of that, one of the biggest, is, is $70 billion to address, address the public housing problem. And this, this is desperately needed um, because the, the problem is absolutely massive. And the existing affordable housing resources that we have at our disposal simply can't do the job. The, the, the things like the low income housing tax credit program would buckle under the weight of fixing the public housing problem. The federal government, I've said this for many years, the federal government needs to, to fix that problem, not draw resources away from the production of other new affordable housing in order to fix that. Other funding in the bill is $5 billion for the Federal Housing Trust Fund, $5 billion for the HOME program, $10 billion for community development block grants. Those are all good things because they, they help us as uh, builders close the gap on affordable housing that otherwise, close the funding gap on deals that otherwise don't work. Uh, and there's also more funding for senior and rural housing as well in that. So there are a laundry list of, of, of housing issues that that bill uh, hopes to address. And, uh, and I, think, uh, I think that's positive. We have to make smart investments in housing. We have to leverage the tools that have a, a proven track record, like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Community development block grants and home funds work very well in addition to that. And, and but I come back to the, the LIHTC program because it's, it's, it's worked really well and it's now over 30 years old. It works because it's a true public private venture. So it, it, it takes the public subsidy on one hand and pairs it with the private sector discipline plus real skin in the game for the long haul. That's why it works so well. So let's leverage those things instead of doubling down on, on programs that, that have proven not to be successful, frankly. And, and in all of this, in, in this whole debate, and, and there will be debate on this and there should be debate, but we should never forget that housing equals jobs. The direct and, direct and indirect economic impacts of building more housing are just huge. Our, our really brilliant NEHB economists have, have done a number of studies on this and the benefit for local economies is huge and something that, that pays us back actually for the investments that we make. And one reason, it's really hard to outsource building of a home. That can't be done in a call center in, in India. That's, that carries a lot of weight. First of all, from an insider's perspective regarding building, but also from the affordable housing. That, um, that, that's something we need to all remember. So going forward, what can the feds do to better support housing? Yeah, um, a, a number of things. Um, and awareness of, about the problem and around the problem of affordable housing has been growing and that's good that's needed to happen for a long long time i think the pandemic has shown us just how important housing really is and and how fragile uh so many families finances really are you know it's it's one paycheck it's one lost job it's you know one uh you know one, you know, car breakdown away from getting behind, and then it's very hard to 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 get back ahead of the game. So we we need to consider that. We we also need to we need incentives. Uh, well, stepping back, we we need real federal resources to address this the scope of this problem because it's huge, and this goes back decades. The cost of housing for a long, long time, and this is more like three, four, potentially five decades, has risen much, much faster than the typical working family income. And that's created a gap. That's an, I call that the affordability gap. 
and and we're simply not producing enough affordable housing we're not producing enough housing to keep up with demand that creates a shortage and prices go up we we need in addition to that i think we need incentives for our cities and our towns to do the right thing with respect to land use and affordable housing and i don't mean sticks i mean carrots and and but most suburban zoning codes favor low density single family development and allow very little high density multifamily and and that simply just drives up the cost of housing but it also constrains the supply of housing and that takes us back to what i just talked about econ 101 the law of supply and demand when supply is constrained and demand you know in the face of continued demand prices naturally go up and that's where we've been for a long time so we need incentives we need carrots not sticks or for municipalities to do the right thing in and trying to to be a partner with uh the federal government and the private sector to address this problem in a big way brilliant brilliant strategy land use is is an intensely local you know decision and this is one of the the pushbacks that that i think hud got on the affirmatively furthering fair housing it's basically it's the feds telling us what to do and i get that density in a lot of ways is a four-letter word in those conversations and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be at all and i think we have thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of units across the country that are great examples of density done well and affordability done well and and we need we need to provide those incentives like i said not carrots but you know not sticks but carrots nimbyism land use affordability those those are kind of my hot buttons because they're yep. all they're all connected um, right and, it, and it's going to take wings in the next four years uh, yeah i really do think there's uh, a potential sea change there but we have to be mindful of the you know we have to be mindful of all the the you know all the perspectives in in every argument and 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 do that in a way to bring people on board that the i think framing the issue in a different way is also another good thing to talk about the frameworks institute has done some really interesting work i don't know if you're familiar with that but it's it's an institute um that or it, it's a, a, a think tank i guess that really looks at how the public perceives issues public policy issues and they've they've attacked a lot of different issues and they've studied i won't say attack they've studied a lot of uh big public policy issues housing being one of those and how we as housing practitioners typically look at these the issue of affordability is we bring statistics to it and we say well 70 percent of 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 you know lower income families pay more than 50 percent of their their income on housing and that just doesn't work what what we need to do is take it out to the bigger picture that says do we want do we think it's a good idea as a society for our teachers to have a a, a, a safe you know nice place to live do we you know when we go to the grocery store and we we go through the checkout line uh, does the the person who helps us there are 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 have we built a society where that person can enjoy a, a safe and stable place to live um and and that's i think most people would answer those questions as saying of course they do but when we couch that in data and housing burden and things like that it's much more it's easier for people to disengage from the very personal you know the, the personal approach which is do do we want the best for our fellow citizens 
And I, I think we do. So. You give the, the topic heart, most definitely. You know, I, I, think, I think that's what it needs because it, it, it is. I mean, if you, the, the struggles that a lot of working families are going through right now, I think are, are very real. And, and we see that on our properties. We mm -hmm. see that in, in our rent rolls and our delinquencies. And, um, and uh, you know, it, uh, I think we need to be, you know, we need to be aware of that. I think we need to be understanding of that. I, I, well, I just wanted to say thank you, Linda. Thank you for bringing, uh, th thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for bringing these topics to light. I think um, I, there are a lot of really, really weighty topics around housing that we need to address as, as, a, as a society. And this is all part of it. The conversation is the way, you know, the way there. Things on Capitol Hill are changing, and fast. We look to our associations like NEHB and their member leadership to give us clarity and actionable steps for the present. And perhaps most importantly, to make our voices heard through the legislative process. Great men like Steve Lawson create housing, real value from ingenuity and hard work. God bless the country's engineers those who live in the present where time touches eternity. Steve, what a pleasure to speak with a pillar of the industry. You inspire a nation. You give us confidence in changing times. Thank you for joining us. I'm Linda Hoffman. Watch for our next exciting episode of NAHB Power Hitters. <laughs>